Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on pump fundamentals. My name is Rich Medeiros. A few words of introduction for myself and the company. Let's start off with the company. TACO, originally T-A-C-O, stood for Thermal Appliance Company, and it was abbreviated to TACO many, many years ago. We are currently celebrating our 100th year anniversary. If it wasn't for COVID-19, we'd have several physical celebrations going on this year, but those physical celebrations are being postponed until next year. But we would like to say thank you very much for attending this presentation. A few words about myself. Again, Rich Medeiros. I am a senior systems engineer here at TACO. I specialize in the engineering and design of HVAC systems. I actually came out of the consulting side of the industry and I've been at it for several years. Today's presentation for Pump Fundamentals will be presented by Brett Zerber. We have a few housekeeping things that we wanna go over. The first thing is that we have up on the screen a uh, clarification for professional development hours certificates. And I'll just uh, kind of read this verbatim. This is a six session online training webinar, which qualifies for six professional development hours. A follow-up email will be sent out approximately 24 hours after the final, final sixth session scheduled for September 9th with a link to the certificate for the six professional development hours. You must attend all six of the live webinar sessions, not the recorded sessions, in order to receive your six professional development hour certificates. Recordings of each session will be posted as they are completed in a mechanical systems online training webinars playlist on the Taco Comfort Solutions YouTube channel, and the YouTube channel is shown here on the screen that Brett is highlighting. Please send any further questions to go to webinar at takeocomfort.com. So we, we put out this little message to clear up any questions that came up last week in terms of how to get your certificates. So with that in mind, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Brett so that he can start his presentation. A couple of quick housekeeping things before I do that. Um, under the, you should have a little, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice today. Um, you should have a little hand that you can wave. You click on that so that we know that you can hear us and see us okay. Let me just drag this down a little bit so I can see what's going on here. I see multiple hands waving, so that means that uh, you can hear us and see us okay. That's great. I will be uh, the moderator for today, so I'll be monitoring the questions. If you have any questions, please just type them into the question area. If someone wants to do a quick test, um, then we can make sure that the uh, question section is working. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, if someone could just type in a question that says, yes, the questions are working good, and that way we'll know that that part of the mechanics is working also very well. Okay, I haven't seen anybody type in anything in the question area. So let me just scroll down, questions working, yes. Okay, great, excellent. All right, I think we're all set to go, Brett. Um, they can hear us, they can see us, and we went through a short intro. So, Brett, take it away. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate that uh, introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, Rich introduced me, but let me introduce myself. My name is Brett Zerba. I'm an applications engineer with Taco. I've been with the company close to 25 years. So, wow. <laughs> Someday, maybe I'll even get to go back into the uh, facility in Cranston, Rhode Island. That's where our headquarters are, uh, but uh, we shall see. Uh, by, by the way, um, at, uh, hopefully all of you have access to the handouts. Uh, there are four handouts. Uh, one is the uh, page you were looking at uh, briefly uh, prior to the start of the uh, presentation. 
The other three are INO manuals. Uh, from, from, they were directly downloaded from our website, and I'm actually going to show you how to do it when I get to a certain point in the presentation. But uh, you can download uh, INO manuals, instruction and operating manuals for uh, the FI pump series line, our base mounted pump, and the KV and KS series lines. There's one of each, and those are the uh, our verticals. And we'll talk more about those as we go, just so you know that they are available. So let's get going. Pump fundamentals, and this is going to be a fundamental class. And uh, if some of you have already sat through it, uh, hopefully you'll pick something else up because uh, there's there's a lot of basic information about pumps. Uh, Rich and I work more in the commercial uh, realm of things for Takeo. So the the what 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 we define or I think of as the bigger pumps, right? The ones that go in the hospitals and on campuses and, and whatnot. But uh, other folks at Takeo, many, many, many folks, and uh, really that was uh, one of our uh, the double O's uh, for many of you out there. Uh, some people know pumps as, as circulators. Well, guess what? The, uh, they're one and the same. Uh, they have many of the same components. So I just wanted to clarify that. And then some people call them rotodynamic pumps or centrifugal pumps. Uh, so there's different names for the same thing, but uh, they're pretty much uh, all the same. So when I talk about fu fundamentals and basics, that's about as basic as you can get. So what does a, a pump do internally? It creates a differential pressure. So uh, hopefully a lot of you, if not all of you, have thought about differential pressures in, in, in a hydronic system, heating or cooling, mostly heating or cooling. We're talking uh, HVAC here. Uh, there's condenser water and heat pumps and whatnot, but you know either the building's got to be heated or cooled. Uh, and uh, so uh, that DP, that's what's being internally uh, created inside this centrifugal pump, this rotodynamic pump, the circulator, the pump itself, whatever you want to call it. And uh, water flows from higher pressure to lower pressure. I don't think any of that, uh, that shouldn't make uh, anybody uh, uh, upset because it makes a lot of sense, right? The delta P that the pump is creating induces flow against system resistance. Well, that system resistance is calculations that somebody has to do. Uh, for a hydro hydronic system. Uh, there's software out there. We'll sh we, we have a presentation in this series that's going to show you that. Actually, last week, Rich showed you how to do manual pressure uh, system resistance calculations, right? And, and, and uh, uh, But that, that delta P has to overcome that system resistance. One thing that we like to clarify, um, in most HVAC uh, systems are closed loop, okay? Uh, that means they're not open to the atmosphere. In an, op uh, in an open system that is open to the atmosphere, and more than likely uh, we're talking a condenser water with an open cell tower of some sort, the delta P that the pump has to overcome also induces lift against atmospheric pressure and gravity for some little di dimension there. So it has to overcome that. In a closed loop system, it does not. So we like to clarify that. Um, is that a pump fundamental? Well, it's a pump calculation fundamental. So uh, we like to uh, uh, clarify that uh, to make sure everyone understands that. So again, a closed loop system, you know, that heating system, you have a boiler in a mechanical room, a chiller uh, located outside, a cooling tower, or whatever. Uh, let's uh, let me forget the cooling tower right now. A oh, heat exchanger, right? Uh, the the uh, chiller is attached to a heat exchanger. Uh, that's a closed loop system. The boiler is attached to some fin tube, some some radiation, a, 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 an air handler, or whatever. The chiller can be attached to air handlers. These are closed loop systems. No lift in a closed loop system. It's pipe length and 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 the the, the calculate system resistance. It's the pipe length and fittings and and the and the boiler itself the chiller itself and, and there's all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, items that it has to get pushed through the water but it's not the uh, lift per se uh, if there's 100 feet pipe up and 100 feet down you got to include 200 feet of pipe but not the lift itself so uh, just keep that in mind and here's a simple picture of a closed loop system I mean, it can't be any simpler than this a little chiller the uh, air cooled chiller pushing the water through here goes through a couple of coils and back through an air and dirt separator, through an expansion tank and back in. It's not, there's no place in here where it's open to the atmosphere. So that's that's a simple uh, closed loop system. And uh, uh, don't go copying this and, and using it as a design. It's a, it's a starting point, but uh, it's, not, it's not, I wouldn't uh, necessarily design, use it as a design. Open system, open to atmosphere, 
that like we talked about like i've already mentioned there is some there is some head for lift or elevation change okay so that has to be included uh in your calculation so uh and on the right hand side here this is my open system here open to atmosphere that's supposed to be an arrow i kind of cut it off a little bit so that elevation change from here to here needs to be included in your calculation not just the piping and the elbows and the fittings and in the valving and, and, and everything like that and the chiller barrel but nonetheless um, we like to clarify that because every once in a while someone asks us that um, and uh, it's just a basic uh, a premise that needs to be uh, taken into account and understood so here's a cutaway of a centrifugal pump uh, and a lot of the uh, component components and terminology um, is universal okay and, but it, it's important to at least uh, be familiar with them uh, do, do you need to study all of these terms and memorize them uh, no but it's it, it, it is good in our industry or you know to, to, to have some basic uh, understanding and knowledge I guess probably one of the most important components it's really one of the few pieces that move in a centrifugal pump right you got a, a shaft that spins in, in the uh, in the impeller right everything else is pretty stationary and here's a, a cutaway picture of an impeller. Notice the veins here are curvature and uh, pump design engineers, R&D engineers, uh, wh whatever you call, want to call these experts, uh, really concentrate hard on designing the uh, veins and the quantity of veins and the curvature. Uh, and all that's taken into account to help uh, get the pump to be as efficient as it can be. And especially in this uh, uh, age of uh, how the, the Department of Energy, the DOE, some of you may be familiar with this, in the States and Canada uh, has, uh, 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 I'll say forced, but has uh, worked with the pumping uh, manufacturers for clean water pumps to improve the efficiency. So a lot of engineers, pump engineers, and, and there aren't a lot of them out there, uh, we, we, were, we were blessed to have some really good ones on our team uh, to work on that. And notice, it spins in this direction, so the water is actually thrown out. It's not scooped, okay? So uh, that's just something uh, something that's uh, basic, but it's important to uh, realize that, that the, the water is thrown out there. Suction kind of makes sense rare, uh, there, right? Suction, eye of the impeller, suction. Uh, and there's a lot of different names for the same terminology in, in, in pumps. Uh, so uh, some of them mean the same thing. They're a little spelled out different, but nonetheless, uh, you'll, you'll get kind of used to that. Feet, right? Makes sense. There's a little holes here. Most um, uh, the volute casing, called the wet end, the volute, the casing, that's the big metal piece um, that, that everything's uh, contained within that sits on the, uh, on the base or, or, or in the piping system or whatever. In, in our industry, it's mostly cast iron. Uh, for the most part, uh, it's uh, I forgot the uh, I forgot the exact grade, but nonetheless, it's just a, a pretty a straightforward cast iron piece. And most of us pump manufacturers, anytime I say us, I'm referring to um, uh, Taco in our competition. So pump manufacturers, us. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I just rattle it off so quick. Uh, 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 we, we offer two two different pressure ratings for for most of our pumps, uh, 125 and a 250. Okay, uh, and uh, I, I'm using U.S. Me uh, t terms, uh, U.S. measurements. Uh, so, so some of you may have to uh, bear with me on that, but nonetheless, um, uh, it, it it is important to to realize that. And and to be quite honest, uh, I'm well over 80, probably closer to 90 percent of our our product line um, that we send out of Cranston. Um, is um, uh, is 125. The 250s may be for a higher higher high rise or or something like that or or some different type of application. So uh, just keep that in mind. Diffuser throat. That's just a, a term that uh, is it important for you folks. No, but at least you know what it is. Discharge makes sense, right? There, that's where the water comes out. In most of these centrifugal pumps, uh, uh, probably over 90 percent, 95 percent are flanged, right? So they have a flange. Uh, arrangement on both uh, the suction and the discharge. Um, uh, so let's see. Oh, oh by the way, at, at, at our facility, um, uh, at TACO, after we've finished assembling a wet end pump, uh, we pressure test it to 1.5 times the working pressure. And that's to make sure there is, uh, we, don't, we don't flow test, uh, pump manufacturers don't flow test. We are required to uh, test our product lines, produce a family of curves, and then per HI, we have to hit that curve uh, 
certain percentage, you know, and we, and we do that. We test them on a, on a periodic basis, but we don't have to flow test every pump unless someone wants a certified one. Uh, that's another whole uh, discussion uh, you could have with your rep. But um, we do pressure test them to make sure there's no leaks and there's no porosity in the casings. Nowadays, uh, the casings really, rarely, rarely leak, uh, and there's very little porosity uh, in it. Uh, the, the manufacturers and the, and the folks that do the uh, uh, casings, uh, castings, do a, a, a pretty good job now. The other term that's uh, uh, you know important to at least re realize is cut water. And that's uh, the dimension between the, the maximum impeller and the pump where the water uh, uh, flows around or distributes back into the diffuser on its way out. And that, that dimension and that cut water design is another very important uh, piece of the puzzle for uh, to make a pump very efficient. And notice this picture is actually showing very little space. Be uh, you can see where my red, uh, hopefully you can all see the red uh, dot there. There's a little space, a little, very little space between the impeller and the cut water. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure this, this picture represents a maximum impeller. Us pump manufacturers can trim that impeller all the way down almost to the hub of this uh, 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 of the impeller. There's an actual meaty piece there. I call it the hub. So it's not unusual for us to uh, uh, trim an impeller. Uh, we could trim it two to probably uh, upwards of three to four inches. I wouldn't be surprised uh, for the for the most part. Each pump uh, pump size is, is a little different. Um, and for the most part, the impellers are, are bronze material. Uh, there are some stainless ones there, uh, but for the most part, they still consider uh, uh, are, are probably bronze. The other thing that we do, and I wouldn't be surprised if others uh, don't do it as well, we balance e every one of our impellers. Uh, and uh, we have a, a, a pretty slick machine that uh, spins it and takes some readings and sees where, where we have to take some weight off. So instead of like a tire where you add weight, to uh, balance it, we actually uh, grind off some weight, or the machine does, uh, to, to, to balance our impellers. Uh, so that's all done um, at, uh, at our facility in uh, Cranston, Rhode Island. Hopefully some of you have been to our facility. Uh, hopefully next year we'll even invite people back to our facility. <laughs> uh, they, maybe they'll even let Rich and I go back in. Uh, they, they've kind of thrown us out. Uh, I shouldn't say that, that's not true. Obviously uh, uh, it's uh, the COVID uh, uh, and, and the uh, procedures that we have to follow. Uh, so, Brett, we have uh, a couple of questions. Awesome. I love questions, um, right, Rich? Don't we like questions? Yeah, it, it's we really great questions. when we get questions. Actually, we have one question that popped up, which I think is really uh, a great question. So, what is the standard impeller size, or rather, what is the standard impeller thickness? Is there an impeller thickness that's standard in the industry? Wow, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I apologize to you, Rich. Um, I do know that the uh, impeller thickness does change with different impeller designs. And right. I do not believe that there is a standard in the industry, but it's such a great question. I'm going to do a follow-up this week and see if I can find out if there's any standards in the industry. I, I mean, that's a great here's, a, here's a picture of an impeller. Um, and, and, you know, you asked about thickness. And you can kind of see that. I mean, that doesn't look more than a quarter inch, maybe three eighths inch, maybe even a little less um, on the on the shrouds, right? The the, the kind of uh, enclosures of the two. Obviously, there's other places where it's a lot thicker, but uh, probably the most important part is that uh, piece there. And um, it, it's really kind of uh, difficult to tell. But that is a question, a great question, and we'll need to uh, uh, investigate that. I think our good friend Greg can answer that at the top of his head. What do you think, Rich? <laughs> yeah, I think so. So we'll we'll do a little research, but I think it's a something I hadn't uh, been asked before. So yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Anything else, or you want, should I move forward? Yeah, why don't we uh, continue along again? Just uh, for those uh, out there in the audience, if you do have a question, please just type it in, and we'll pause periodically and read your questions. Thanks. Super. Uh, so, you know, and here's another cutaway. Uh, there's that suction. There's the cut water, right? You can see the, the, the it diffuses. It, it, it sends the water out and out the impeller, out the discharge. The impeller eye is the lowest point of low, uh, is the point of lowest pressure. Kind of makes sense, right? That's where it's coming in. And then as this ra spins radially, the water is uh, diffused out, sent out, spun out, uh, forced to the outside of the impeller. Um, and that's how um, it divert, it's diverted out. So pretty straightforward. 
nothing there should be a surprise, but it, I think it's all kind of makes sense uh, once you uh, once you kind of see it. Just, I, I like to show this just so for knowledge, okay? I'm not trying to point fingers or, or anything like that, although obviously I work for Taco. Uh, but nonetheless, there are two types, two different types in the industry of pump discharge arrangements: centerline and tangential. Okay, tangential and centerline. Uh, all of Takos are centerline, and we chose that for a couple of different reasons. One was strength, uh, weight evenly distributed. So any piping, I always forget to get my little spotlight here. Any piping that weighs on down on here, although um, we're hoping it's properly supported, it, it is distributed evenly uh, around the uh, casing. And then it is self-venting. And what we mean by that is any air, any air that gets in here, because uh, invariably there's air uh, gets into the system, uh, piping system, uh, especially during startup, right? Uh, until, uh, until everything's kind of uh, uh, operational. Uh, so any air that gets in the pump and pumps, pumps the uh, centrifugal HVAC hydronic pumps. They don't, we don't like they don't like air inside of them. Uh, that's for sure. It, it's not uh, the pump doesn't remove it from the system, but it does uh, find its way out, right? Because it, it goes out the highest point. Uh, these th this here could get trapped a little bit uh, right there. Uh, I, I think the, fo the these folks that designed the tangential ones uh, did that because um, uh, for, for many many moons. It was a, a higher efficient pump, a couple of points higher efficiency. And it makes sense because if you think about water moving around, right, you know, it's, it's like a head loss calculation we do in pipe. Well, the less, the less twisting and turning and, and whatnot, the less uh, head loss. And the same thing here, right? It just comes straight out. Here, uh, instead of going straight out, we got a little more turn here before it goes out. So that does cost you a few points. But um, once we redesigned these pumps for DOE, uh, we were able to, our, 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 our pump design engineers, and uh, uh, they haven't uh, let the spill the beans, uh, of, of, sort of say, for Rich and I, so we don't know what they did, but uh, our pumps uh, have caught up, if not surpassed, uh, in some applications, if not many, uh, compared to our competitors. So uh, that old wise tale has kind of gone away now. But nonetheless, uh, both, both, both of these work, um, and there's plenty of them out there in the industry. In, in that regard, but it's it's really centerline and tangential, and you'll go into mechanical rooms and you'll see them both. At least you'll know uh, what what they are in, in, in there. That that's pretty much it. Centrifugal pump components. <clears throat> I mean, pretty much straightforward. This is a base-mounted pump, right? Well, how can you tell? Well, there's the base. The Taco base is actually four uh, pieces of channel welded together. Um, obviously, you can't see them all. You can kind of see it. And it, so it is enclosed all the way, but there's a cavity in here and it, there's cross supports. You can kind of see these cross supports here and it depends on the size of the pump. There could be more, could be less, whatever. And then we do have a, 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 a drain, uh, there's a solid plate underneath here and then the drain pan sits on top so that the wet end does um, uh, uh, rest on a solid plate. So that's our, our base. So that's a, you know kind of our design um, drain pan. It does extend far enough in ours, farther, further enough out, whatever the heck I should be saying there, to catch any dripping uh, that takes place here. There's the suction. You can see the flange here. There's a little uh, vein there, and, and many of us uh, in the industry uh, have that, that there. And that, that's just another way to help straighten the water as it comes into the, uh, the volute, the wet end, the, the casing. Uh, very, very important. It, it does not replace... Um, a, a suction diffuser or straight run a pipe. It does not replace good engineering practice, but it's just another uh, way to help straighten uh, stuff uh, as it goes in. Discharge, I think that makes sense. Casing, volute, there's another word, casing, volute, wet end, they're all, they're all synonymous. Bearing frame, we're gonna talk about that even more greater detail, motor, and then a coupler with guard. Um, <laughs> If you get a chance to download the INO manuals, I was uh, taking a gander at them this morning, and one of the things it says, do not operate this uh, piece of equipment without the guard in place. And uh, uh, so if you go into a mechanical room and you, uh, you know, it depends on the situation, but if, if there's no guard ar around there and that you see that uh, uh, coupler spinning, uh, you, you might want to uh, suggest to somebody uh, privately or, or, or more than privately that they put the guard back on uh, because something something bad could happen down the, down the way. 
One thing that's uh, a couple of things uh, that are important to realize about base mounted pumps, especially HVAC, uh, different industries, some of maybe the municipalities, different types of pumps, higher end pumps. You may not have to do this for, for base mounted pumps. Um, it's right in the INO manuals. It's recommended that these are grouted. These are grouted. So uh, what that means is that cavity in there is filled up with some, uh, a concrete mix, a grouting mix. Um, after the pump base is leveled and the pump itself is um, aligned, okay? And we're going to talk about alignment as well. So uh, that's just some, some uh, advice there. Matter of fact, I'm going to uh, go to our website very shortly after I'm done yapping here on this screen uh, just to show you uh, a couple of things uh, in that regard. But uh, nonetheless, uh, aligning these there's two shafts this is considered a split coupled pump that means there's a shaft attached to the impeller and then there's the motor shaft but they're not one and the same a direct coupled pump a closed coupled pump uh, there's another two terms that mean the same thing um, uh, pretty much the motor shaft would be the uh, impeller shaft so in any split coupled pump especially base no excuse me not any but base mounted split coupled pumps Alignment is one of the key elements to proper um, uh, startup and um, operation of these uh, uh, base mounted pumps. And that alignment is not just vertical and horizontal, it's angular as well. Um, and uh, really it should be laser aligned. And most of the Takeo manufacturers reps um, offer a, an alignment service uh, because they have, they have some uh, money in the, in the game, obviously, and they want all these pumps to, uh, uh, to, to operate correctly once they're started up. I mean, they are aligned properly at our factory, but it, you know they're moved. How many times are they moved and shipped and uh, over the roadways and whatnot, bumps and bruises and whatnot? So uh, j just keep that in mind. And then, you know, hopefully someplace in your specifications, uh, you, you, you talk about uh, when they do in piping that to pipe away from the pump, don't pipe to the pump. What do I mean by that? Think about a, a piece of pipe coming down here, right? And there's a long radius elbow and you pipe over to the this and there's a flange on the end of that. And now the chances of those two lining up, uh, Nats on is uh, a little light. So what happens is uh, people use the uh, the big screwdriver to, 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 to force it to, to line up and um, tighten up the bolts, maybe coming down the same thing, whatever piping coming down horizontal. And sure enough, that's going to put stresses on the pump, could knock it out of alignment or, 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 or something bad is going to happen or it's going to shorten the life. And that's something bad as well. So uh, re really, it's, uh, uh, you know, we need to probably spend a, a couple hours on how to properly uh, uh, do piping for pumping systems uh, for, for these simple, simple products. But nonetheless, it's, it's important. And then uh, Rich and I always recommend that you put pressure gauges on both sides, on the suction and on the inlet. Um, ho hopefully that's in your specs or on your detail drawings. It's just something that's uh, pretty important uh, for, for diagnosing and for keeping track uh, of things as you go. What else did I want to say here? That pretty much all the motors now are, 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 are stock items. Uh, you know, there's repair shops near most of uh, those places. Obviously, it's, it's always nice to have a standby or a spare pump, but uh, nonetheless, the motors, uh, us pump manufacturers offer the, we extend the warranty of the motor manufacturers. So we warranty our product and then, you know, there's certain warranty on the motors. Uh, Takeo uses Baldor US motors for the most part, but there's others out there. And again, they're all the same frame size and, and whatnot. And notice right here, uh, there's uh, some spacers underneath the uh, feet of the pump. So um, in our thought process, when we design these bases, um, we actually allow uh, for most, uh, most of our uh, pumps combinations, there's six motors that would fit on this, uh, the standard base. You just either have some type of spacers as the motor shaft dimensions change, right? So, so the biggest one sits right on the base and then uh, and that's two frame sizes uh, 254 256 and then the next one's 145 143 or, or 213 i think or 215s uh they, they may sit on one spacer and then the 143s 145s these are all frame size motors uh if, if, if you google it or look it up uh they, they their center line's different so that we have even more spacers there so uh, it just it reduces the uh, stock uh, that of bases that we have uh, so uh, pretty much that's all i got again again the correct correct piping going in here 
Uh, most pump manufacturers offer what we call trim or a suck. It's a piece of equipment. It's a suction diffuser. It's a product and that has straightening veins in it. So it uh, makes sure the water goes in nice and laminar. Uh, so there's no uh, rushes of water. There's no twisting and air getting in there. Or, or you just need five to seven pipe diameters with a long radius elbow. Um, uh, to, 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 to properly design that. So uh, just some minor, some important basic stuff that should always be considered or shown on your details in your MEP files or whatever, just uh, some recommendations there. And we're gonna talk about the bearing frame in greater detail um, right now, <laughs> uh, by, by the way. So here's kind of a breakdown uh, of what we were talking about. And that great question about the impeller uh, thickness uh, you can kind of see it right there. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to tell. And then this and this isn't that big of a pump, so it probably even changes on, uh, on different size pumps. I will say this: if the pumps uh, design, if the system designed correctly, and there's no MPSH issues, and, and it's a pretty clean water system, usually the impeller is going to last uh, as long, or if not longer, than anything else on the pump. Uh, we don't really get much uh, uh, returns of impellers. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's always uh, there's always circumstances out there and using MPSH is one of them. But uh, these impellers, uh, they're, they're pretty sturdy uh, pieces of equipment. And again, mostly bronze um, material. Excuse me. Uh, one of the one of the items that obviously uh, uh, on wet end pumps is the mechanical seal. Um, uh, you know, John Crane type 21 uh, is is pretty standard. Uh, there are some uh, options out there for for different materials. Keep in mind these are mostly clean water pumps, uh, right? So, uh, we, I don't need to give you the definition of clean water, but nonetheless, uh, it, it doesn't have a lot of chemical uh, uh, capabilities. But one thing it doesn't like is grit and sand and and, and any type of uh, dirt or anything like that. That really will will be the first thing to destroy a, a mechanical seal. So I always recommend. Um, to uh, uh, buy uh, in your spe in this, the, the contractor buy a spare seal or two um, uh, because during startup, it's it, un unfortunately uh, these pumps are made uh, are designed for clean water applications and many times uh, uh, at the startup phase uh, it's not clean water right uh, if you think about it, if you've ever been to a job site and I'm sure many of you if not all of you have been um, uh, there's a little dust and dirt and grime and you know the pipe could sit outside the pipe is moved and the, there's welding uh, grit inside of it or, or whatever uh, and when these pumps are, are used as the startup pump instead of having a, some other way to start up the system um, um, that that seal isn't going to last uh, so whatever pump is used for that uh, that seal uh, has a good chance of um, uh, leaking uh, before the punch list and before you're off the job site so uh, just a, a, a quick recommendation there our okay, buried Brett, frame yep we have uh, we have a great question i think it was um super probably uh from your previous slide but um yeah the, the question basically says, you mentioned pressure sensors, and I think he means pr you mentioned pressure gauges probably. I, I, yes. On I, both I, sides, meaning on the no. suction and the discharge side. The question is, what do you think about one gauge with manual valves so it eliminates the inaccuracy between the two gauges? So if you could give your opinion, and I'll, I'll also give my opinion, and I think we can, that's a great question <laughs> because that comes up uh, in the field all the time. Yeah, uh, that is a great question, but we like to have two. Uh, we recommend two so you can see the differences between this, this, the, the pump itself. Uh, Rich, can you add to that? Yeah, I, I think um, I like both techniques, but if I had a choice, I'd like to have two separate gauges. And that's because I'd like to see the uh, suction and discharge pressures simultaneously, especially if I'm troubleshooting in the field. Now to eliminate potential problems if I'm doing accurate measurements in the field I'll sometimes swap the gauges to make sure they're reading the same values now, so in other words I'll take the discharge gauge let's say the suction pressure was uh, 40 pounds and the discharge was 60 pounds I'll swap the two gauges to make sure that they are reading their corresponding values and then put them back again that way I know the gauges are accurate if they're both reading the same value for the same location. 
Yeah, yeah, so yes, also... you're correct. The, uh, one gauge with valves uh, eliminates the difference between the gauges, but it's more convenient to have two gauges so you can see them simultaneously. So there are pros and cons to each. And and, and I, I guess uh, we probably should also state, Rich, that we sh uh, a flow meter of some sort should should try to be included as well. Wouldn't you recommend that too? Wouldn't we recommend that? Yes. Yeah, the number one problem uh, uh, for field measurements uh, is uh, is the flow. A lot of times we'll get calls. We had one just the other day, and uh, they said, well, the flow is 426 gallons per minute. And I said, what are you using for a flow meter? And then they, they didn't really have a good flow meter. I said, well, based on the the pressure differential and the power consumption, it looks like the flow value that you're telling us is incorrect. And it turned out that instead of being 426 gallons per minute, the actual flow was around 200 gallons per minute. So yeah, an accurate flow meter is a is a real real helpful, especially when you're troubleshooting. I, I mean, to, to to be quite honest, troubleshooting. Uh, and many times we get calls, that, so we're we're blind, right? Because we're just talking to somebody, and and, and until you, you you cut through the chase and get get the basic information, well, what what's your actual? How are you getting that measurement and all of that? Uh, so uh, uh, unfortunately, you, you know. That, but anyways, uh, the the more you can put there, the the better it is uh, for troubleshooting. That's for sure. But great question. Uh, that's a great question. That's for sure. Thank you. Anything else? Um, let's. No, I think we can continue. Go ahead, Brett. Okay. Super. Thanks, Rich. So bearing frames, uh, you know, we, we have four, five, six different models. Our current FI model, the ones we make day in and day out in Cranston, Rhode Island, um, are have sealed for life bearings in there. So they do not require any lubrication. There's bearings in there that help uh, the shafts to stay in alignment, uh, but those bearings are sealed for life. They do not do not require any lubrication, and and, and they should last 15, 20, 25 years. I, I mean, they're, they're they're very very sturdy. Um, uh, so the L10 life is 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 really exceptional as long as everything's in proper alignment, right? So those shafts have to be in proper alignment. Um, uh, and we actually have a Fushita seal here that prevents some um, uh, grime and grit from getting into that because there's an opening here, right? I, I think we can all realize that that the that that shaft has to protrude out, uh, it has to come out of there. So there's going to be some type of an opening. So the, we have stopped we we stop uh, items from getting in there. We center uh, we have um, uh, uh, standardized on Woods Duraflex coupler. Very good for variable speed applications, which is what 80% plus of the market. I'll show you a picture of another one uh, very, very shortly as well. And notice the motor, mostly all premium efficiency now. Um, and um, I would, I would recommend, I would recommend that you specify or put in your specifications. Um, uh, and if I say it wrong, Rich, uh, correct me. But is it Regis? Regis Aegis rings? What, what, I always forget the the actual terminology. But Aegis. there. A Aegis rings. Aegis the rings. A and we have a couple of quick questions too. Oh, super. Yeah. So here's the first one. Yeah. Is there a benefit of using a fine mesh strainer for startup to reduce the probability of harming the mechanical seal? Um, yes, there's a benefit as long as you remember to remove it. As a matter of fact, the Taco suction diffuser um, has a startup strainer in there uh, that's very fine mesh. Uh, that that needs to be removed um, uh, after uh, startup. But yes, that there there is a benefit to uh, help um, uh, alleviate the potential for mechanical seal uh, failure uh, during the startup uh, uh, period. G great point. And then the second question is, can you replace the bearing frame assembly if there's a premature failure? Yes, you can. Uh, we have a, a recommend. Uh, we have a spare parts list and a bearing frame. Is is an item that uh, uh, we don't we don't send too many out just bearing frames, but uh, uh, but yes, uh, it can be it, it, it unbolted and bolted back into in, into place. Uh, obviously, there's other uh, realignment and stuff like that. The impeller has to come off, but nonetheless, yes, uh, that is a replaceable part. And again, not very. And often. then one last question, Brett, <clears throat> for this category. Yeah. In what cases should you use packing seals instead of mechanical seals? Uh, 
for most HVAC hydronic uh, applications, I, I would stay away from uh, uh, packing s s seals. Um, uh, but uh, Rich, do you have any uh, uh, advice on that? I, I mean, maybe maybe yeah, real actually, dirty. Yeah, uh, actually, we kind of touched base on this uh, the other day when it came to the vertical turbines. Right, that's and, a different uh, pump. It's a different pump. In our standard uh, base-mounted pump, vertical inline pumps, um, they have mechanical seals. We do not offer a packing seal. However, in the larger, I believe the GTs and the TCs, uh, in some cases, not the TCs, but the, the GTs, um, we can offer a packing seal for the larger pumps, but the overwhelming majority of pumps for the HVAC industry are mechanical seals today. Ten, yep, for sure. And then again, uh, th those uh, those rings that you put on there or, uh, or include in the motor will uh, help from stray currents affecting the motor. And uh, nowadays, there's a lot of <laughs> not just dirty water. There's dirty electricity, or that that uh, uh, can cause issues with the drive slash motor uh, uh, stuff there. Uh, so uh, I, I would add it to your um, I would add it to your specifications, Spe especially on a, it, it, it's not going to be a five or ten horse motor that's going to have the problem. It's going to be that 50, 60 horse motor. So Aegis ag rings, Aegis rings uh, are, are are something that uh, you may, uh, you know, if you need more information, uh, contact your TACO rep or or get let Rich and I know, send in an email, we can get you more information on it. But it, it really does uh, negate, um, the more we can negate, or the more uh, design engineers can negate an issue with a pump, or, 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 or anything uh, in the design phase by putting something, putting it in your spec, uh, the, the better off uh, you, you'll, we all will be, that's for sure. There's a cutaway of the Woods Duraflex coupler. Um, you can kind of see uh, what, what it is. You know, it, it, there's not much to it, but nonetheless, there's a cutaway. And, they, and their website has a lot more information on it, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we standardize on it. Here's the old style, I call it the old style. It's still out there, the Sureflex coupler. Um, uh, and, and, and this is uh, the arrangement here, excuse me, and uh, when I first started, that, that was our standard, but more and more pumps uh, had drives added to them, and uh, we were finding that this material here uh, wasn't holding up well to the starting and stopping and the speeding up and slowing down, and, uh, and many applications, all of a sudden, this uh, black dust would show up on the base. Uh, and then obviously once the teeth start going away, then, then the coupling's no good and it had to be replaced. So uh, we, we've chosen to uh, go with the other style. But just so you are familiar with them both, uh, and, and um, you know, they, I'm sure they both work if they're right and designed correctly and other people may use them, but uh, we've standardized on the other ones. So uh, just keep that in mind. Most popular still is the end suction, base mounted. There's the split coupled, there's the closed coupled. What do I mean by closed coupled? Again. The motor shaft is the impeller shaft. Here, the motor shaft has a coupler between um, it and the shaft that um, um, uh, ties into the impeller. <clears throat> Personally, uh, uh, I would not design. I would not specify a put a closed coupled pump over 10 to 15 horse. These motors get very, very heavy, very, very quickly, uh, horsepower wise, and uh, you're just um, uh, you, you really, from an engineering standpoint. Uh, the maintenance guys uh, are going to have an issue down the road, but us pump manufacturers offer this uh, uh, type of arrangement up to 60 horse because this is a JM style motor and that motor frame goes up to 60 horse and it's used in, in different applications, not just for pumps. Um, so uh, we all offer it, but really uh, once you get above 510, you know, uh, you, you're doing a disservice to the maintenance guys. It's just a hard thing to, uh, to, to, to change out when you need to access the seal or, or something to that effect, right? It, 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 it kind of makes sense. These split coupled pumps, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't have to, uh, uh, dis, you don't have to take the motor off. You may have to unbolt it and twist it out of the way so you can have access to uh, move the shaft back. But nonetheless, you do not have to disassemble the motor and lift it out of place. Uh, so uh, that's one thing that's, uh, you know, uh, split couples are, 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 uh, have going for them. Let me, uh, I, 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 I wanted to bring this up. So I'm on the Takeo website. I want to go to products. I keep talking about the I&O manuals. 
right? So here's a, our website. If I go to FI series pumps, right? I went to products, FI series pumps. Notice here's the instruction sheet. So that's what you can download. But look, notice right here, there's also a video on how to grout base mounted pumps. I'm not going to play those, right? We, I still have some more yapping to do. And there's also a video on how to replace the FI pump seal. So these videos are, are very great learning tools or, or, or ideas uh, for, for showing people how to do things correctly as well. And then this instruction sheet, if, if, if I brought that up, that would start scaring you and you may never want to install another pump because uh, I'm sure there's always shortcuts on how people do things. But nonetheless, uh, they're very, very easy uh, to get to. And if I go back to products, pumps, uh, I'll just quickly go to the, uh, I'll click on the KV one. Thought I clicked on it. Come on now. And you can see we uh, we also have an instruction sheet there. So, um, I'm, and, but there's no video for that one. I think there's a video on the KS one. But nonetheless, I did want to show you. Uh, I, I've been talking about that. Uh, so, anyways, uh, let's get back to uh, let's get back to what we we're yapping about. Nowadays, uh, there are other style of uh, common pumps. Um, uh, we call them verticals. Uh, excuse me. We call them inline pumps horizontal and vertical. And the they're differentiated by shaft orientation. So even though the piping is vertical, these are called horizontal because of the shaft orientation. The, the piping is horizontal, but the shaft orientation uh, defines these as vertical. So uh, just keep that in mind. Let's talk about the smaller ones first. This is our 1900, probably goes up to 250, 300 GPM. And this is our 1600, split coupled, direct coupled. Both pretty small. Uh, I, I think we get up to five horse, maybe a, a, a little higher than that for special applications. But nonetheless, you can kind of see them. Uh, and they're, they're out there, and there's plenty of them out there. And we continue to manufacture these uh, day in and day out. And the competitors all offer uh, similar models. Um, uh, but one thing that I like to – and these have instruction sheets as well. I apologize. I didn't put them in the handouts. But now that you know how to go get them, you can go see them yourself and read them. Um, uh, they recommend – Actually, it's not a recommendation. It's a it's a requirement that they, these motors are not supported in the field. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, you go into a mechanical room, you'll see these with a you know a channel bar underneath it and some eye rods sticking up and supporting that. And same thing maybe on these. Um, invariably, that if that's tightened, it's going to knock this out of alignment. They are designed to be self-supporting. Do not support them in the field. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know how you get that across to the contractor, but nonetheless, they do not require that. Um, I, I'd hate to say read the INO manual, but that's another whole uh, conversation. These are uh, a, a very fast uh, product line for us, moving product line, growing product line, uh, and, and they have a lot of uh, good features to them. Uh, these are the vertical pumps, uh, direct coupled, closed coupled. KV, that's our model number, and split coupled KS. Um, and there's a couple, uh, many times, if they're designed correctly, they should take up less, less space uh, in the mechanical room. So that's one of the, the big, big possibilities is savings there. Number two, you can change the seal for this. Uh, this one here, you got to pull the motor out, right? You got to pull the motor out. So again, it's like this: the, the other one I said that that was our CI model on the base mounted. You shouldn't get much bigger than 10 horse. Um, uh, for, for these. I mean, they go up to 60 horse again, but these split coupled ones, excuse me, uh, you don't have to uh, uh, touch that motor at all. You can actually uh, replace that seal by, uh, well, this guard here, you're going to take the guard off uh, and you unbolt this um, aluminum uh, uh, coupler, uh, pry it apart and uh, unbolt it, uh, unbolt the cover, and you can actually have enough room to lift it and change the seal. And again, there's a video on the KS uh, uh, product line that shows you how to do that. It's relatively easy, but again, you don't have to move the motor. And the other big advantage from uh, for these type of pumps, these two right here especially, is they do not require alignment in the field. They are bolted and they are in alignment uh, prior to, um, uh, they're not like a base mounted pump that has to be uh, technically probably laser aligned um, uh, and it's probably in some of your specifications that that's the requirement um, to, to guarantee the proper alignment. But nonetheless, these these don't require alignment. And that could be a big deal if uh, if you've ever had some noise or vibration issues or or whatnot. Um, uh, so uh, uh, just uh, just something to consider there. 
Uh, and, and nowadays, you know, uh, Rich and I get asked which which one's better for which application. Um, and, and to be quite honest, uh, w the the best answer for that is it's uh, it's uh, office. Uh, the, it's your choice. It's uh, your preference. Um, so uh, we ha we think this one's maybe a little more p positive. And, and, and really, if you look at uh, head and flow, in um, efficiencies and pricing, um, it, it's pretty much a wash for the most part. I mean, there could be a little difference here. You, you know, if if you need a 500 GPM pump at 40 feet ahead, um, and maybe the KV um, is the right one uh, and is a per point or two percentage higher. And maybe if it's 400 GPM at, at 40 feet ahead, maybe the uh, base mounted one's a little higher efficiency wise. Uh, but and then the price wise, uh, it, it's pretty close. So uh, something to consider. People ask me that. So it's really uh, it's really uh, your preference. Um, application wise, like, like a condenser water or uh, chilled water, hot water, uh, these guys are going to, uh, they're both going to hold up and do the job. So uh, just, uh, just make sure you understand that. These guys do go up quite higher, the verticals now uh, for head and flow, uh, and you'll see that in a chart uh, uh, momentarily. Uh, Rich touched upon the, the split case pumps, the uh, TAs, uh, uh, GTs, uh, TCs, top connections, uh, these these all uh, are, are heavy duty pumps. Uh, they go up a lot higher in head and flow. Uh, in, in many, many moons ago, through upwards of 30 years ago, a lot of people specified these because they felt they were a better design uh, and they were gonna last a lot longer because of the, the way the water gets into the impeller on both sides and whatnot, double suctions. Um, but really the, the uh, over the, the, the past many years, uh, all of us pump manufacturers have improved our base mounted pumps. So the, the, the length of time that they're going to be, uh, they're, they're going to outlive the building. I, I'm telling you that uh, the base mounted pumps. Uh, so that, that thought process is probably uh, not, not as important. I've seen people use this. Uh, we had a nice project out in, uh, out in Portland, uh, out in the Oregon area uh, where they use TCs to save some space uh, in the mechanical room. So they were able to save some space there, but Nonetheless, uh, uh, these these are product lines uh, that we all offer um, as well. Uh, and and uh, it, th these guys did not have to meet the DOE requirements. They were not in the uh, uh, the list of pumps. Uh, that's a whole separate conversation, but they were not in that list of, uh, of pumps. Uh, it does allow access to impeller seals without moving them over or describing the, the piping. Relatively new, I keep saying that, but that's not true. Um, they've been out there for years, but uh, Taco acquired a company in, in 2012, uh, a vertical turbine company. So we do uh, have a complete line of uh, vertical turbines in the uh, that we offer. For HVAC, it's probably condenser water, although uh, we are seeing some folks think about in a mechanical room, uh, maybe uh, saving even more space if space is that much of a premium and installing one of these, but they would need type of some type of sump to, uh, uh, to to work in the design of the system. So, but nonetheless, uh, they, they do, uh, they, they, they need to go in a sump of some sort, uh, vertical line shaft turbines, and they all have their own different terminologies. Like uh, we all consider this the motor, they, in their thought process, it's the driver. So <laughs> uh, it's a synonymous name, uh, so something to consider. Just so you can see how it works, um, the, the turbine, uh, you know, the, the bowl end has to be below the water. Motor is above grade. So if, if you go uh, drive through a farm air, land area, you might see some of these uh, motors just sticking up there. So these motors here, uh, many of them are, are, are good for the environment. Uh, there's different enclosures, better enclosures than, uh, than our, most of our uh, ODP or TEFC ones. And then the, uh, the pump rotation, there's a column here that attaches the bowl assemblies. Uh, very important, but you can see the water comes in, right, into the bottom here, goes up the line shaft, and then out to the system. So pretty straightforward, but that's how it works um, uh, nonetheless. Here's a kind of a capacity range of, of, of what the pumps uh, offer. Uh, you know, it's it's a general number. I, I could change some numbers here if I uh, update this chart, but it gives you an idea uh, for the most part. Uh, you know, just, just so you so you know, and I, I think I think our 1600s do go up a little higher, but this is kind of more for the. Anyways, nonetheless, you can see that the verticals do go up quite high here. Um, uh, so uh, uh, 
please uh, specify uh, 10 600 horse uh, KS pumps. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll be your best friends if you can specify Taco on that. <laughs> I, I digress. I, 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 it's getting late in the presentation, so I'm getting a little goofy here. But nonetheless, it kind of gives you an idea of some of the ranges uh, that are available here. For the most part, I, I think uh, I think we all can agree uh, in the U.S. it's 1760 is the is the normal speed. Uh, you know, there are 3500s uh, offered out there. Um, uh, motor pricing probably is going to be a, a challenge or, 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 or more. S same thing with the 1160s. Uh, replacements will be a little uh, higher. And the faster you spin the, the pump, the, the, the quicker it's going to wear out. So uh, that's something to be considered. 1160s uh, has its use, uh, but nonetheless, uh, most, of the, most of the pumps we send out are, are 1760. Rich, how are we doing for questions? So we did have a question pop up. Um which I thought was kind of interesting. And it says, how are vertical inline pumps supported? Great question. Um, at, um, if you read the INO manuals that are attached, um, uh, up to a certain horsepower, they're self-supporting, but once you get over, I think it's 20 horse, um, oops, uh, there's uh, holes at the bottom here. There's holes at the bottom uh, of, the, of, this, uh, of the casing or the wet end and you can bolt, bolt a stand there. We actually offer, we sell them, or we uh, it's an option that you can buy the stand, but uh, it can be uh, supported uh, from below. Um, so it should be supported at, after a certain point uh, of horsepower. Hopefully that answers the question. You got anything yeah, to I add think, to that, Rich? Um, your, it, I just yeah. qu checked quickly on one of your handouts. It does show on your INO, IOM manual handout, it yep. shows the different uh, mounting arrangements for vertical inlines with or without the stand. Right. And actually, the, 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 the KS models, the split couples models, you cannot mount horizontally. The, the direct couples, the KV models, you can, I wouldn't recommend it, but I have seen them mounted horizontally, meaning the motor uh, is, is horizontal instead of vertical like you see here. And that's only up to, I think, 15 horse. Uh, anything above that, it's got to be uh, in this orientation. Uh, but that's in the manual as well. Um, we, we don't get that question too often, nor does uh, the application come up too often. But nonetheless, uh, the smaller ones can be mounted uh, horizontally. And again, uh, uh, I'm very, uh, I forget numbers uh, faster than I remember them. So uh, please check uh, or with your rep or, or with the INO manual be, before you go ahead and design one in that, uh, that, that configuration. So Brett, we're getting close to the end of our hour. Um, yep. If we could wrap it up, a couple of more yep. slides and then take a yep. few questions. Yep, so uh, uh, one, one of the basic fundamental pages, it's a, and it's really not that fundamental, but it is once you start looking at the, uh, the uh, uh, formulas is these affinity laws, centrifugal pump affinity laws. And it's really the relationship be between all of the um, uh, flow and head and horsepower. And, and you can see impeller diameters or impeller speeds, right? And us pump manufacturers use it. Uh, it's, in, it's embedded in our programming uh, to, to calculate what, what size uh, uh, impeller to trim the impeller. Every time we get a flow and head calculation, we need to trim that impeller. Uh, so uh, somewhere there's a calculation uh, that follows this. And it's pretty much pretty straightforward. On the left-hand side, it's speed change, uh, right? Uh, flow rate uh, is R2 over R1. Uh, uh, head loss is squared and horsepower is cubed. Impeller diameter change, it's the other way around. Excuse me, it's not the other way around. Instead of speed change, it's impeller diameter change to get you the new answers here. Uh, so uh, again, you can, uh, we're, we're touching upon this. Uh, I wanted to at least expose you to it. I'm not going to go through any calculations. This isn't a, a hard, a hard, I shouldn't say that word, a hard, uh, I don't even know what, what word to use. This isn't a big math class that we're going to uh, get into high, high level math, but nonetheless, uh, you can go through some of the uh, affinity laws uh, in that regard. And then the last slide is just a, a, a pump curve. And uh, we've gone over that in, in other presentations. You know, we have our range, the uh, affinity, uh, excuse me, the horsepower lines are usually curved in this direction. Uh, oh, no, they come down here, they're usually dotted, right? And then your uh, impeller uh, max and the minimum, the actual. And then nowadays, uh, most uh, manufacturers show you the actual design point with the system curve going through it. 
and then your MPSH is shown down here in the bottom. So it's pretty pretty standard information on these curves. So Rich, that's my last slide uh, besides the question slides. So let's 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 try to answer some more questions if there are any. Yeah, there are a few questions out there, Brett. Um, so okay. one is, can you tell what the gallons per minute is if you uh, can measure the inlet and outlet pressures at the pump flanges? If, in other words, if you can uh, measure the pressure at the inlet and the pressure at the outlet, can you determine the GPM? Uh, the answer is yes. You might need some more information, but yes, uh, that's why we recommend you have that, th those gauges there. Correct, Rich? Yes. Yeah, so uh, one thing that we always have to make sure of is remember most gauges in the field are measuring the pressure in pounds per square inch gauge, but we publish the pressure differential for the pump in feet of water column, and the conversion is 2.31 feet per pound per square inch. So if you had a discharge pressure, say of 30 pounds per square inch gauge, the suction pressure of 20, the differential would be 10 pounds per square inch. You would have to multiply that by 2.31. So 10 times 2.31 is 23.1. Now you can look up that pressure differential on a pump curve and you can determine what the GPM is, assuming that you know what Something the impeller else. diameter is right you you need to know and that should be on the uh tag um of the pump it should show you the impeller diameter um there so that that information needs to be there as well but yes uh then we have another question um did you recommend installing a rubber coupling to avoid transmitting vibration from the pump to the piping and I think um, they're talking about uh, couplings in the piping system. And, and I, it's not a, a simple answer because uh, noise and vibration generated by a pump um, has to be evaluated to see if the pump should be mounted on an inertia pad because sometimes just putting in a flex connection or a, a rubber coupling is not sufficient. You have to have an inertia pad sitting on springs in, in concert with um, rubber or other types of flex connections on the piping. We, we, we've actually seen um, pieces of equipment like that. If the pump's installed correctly and that component's installed correctly, that's a great recommendation. But what we've seen is those couplings, uh, they're braided. Uh, some of them are braided. I've actually seen them not straight. I've seen them twisted. So you know that there's forces and the piping's not done, uh, installed correctly. So um, it, 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 like Rich says, it's a, it's a difficult answer from a quick standpoint. Um, it doesn't hurt as long as things are installed correctly. <laughs> so I think we have uh, time for one last question. Uh, Brett, is yep. the, and the question, is the warranty void if you do not use laser alignment on startup? And I can answer that question. Um, no, the, the warranty is not void if you do not use laser alignment on startup. However, the instruction INO manual indicates that the alignment should be within five thousandths of an inch in both the horizontal and the vertical planes, and a highly skilled um technician can align motor and pump shafts to be within five thousandths of an inch if they're using a, a dial indicator for example but no you don't have to use a warranty but you do have to make sure that it's aligned within five thousandths of an inch yeah, we, so that we, Brett, that brings us to uh the conclusion we're running a few minutes over yeah super. um so at this point, uh, Brett, do you want to say a few parting words before I yes, sign uh, off? Yes, I, I tell you, what, what a great, uh, great audience. Uh, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, I continue, uh, and I'm sure Rich does too, learn on it every day. And most of the time, it's from the questions that you folks bring out. And uh, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Rich, take it away. Thank you so much for participating in our presentation this afternoon. We're on uh, session two of our total of six sessions. Uh, we look forward to having you folks uh, next week at our next session. 
And at this point, I would like to say thanks again. Stay safe out there, and we'll sign off for now. Take care, Bye, everyone. Everybody.